this is Jonas Brasco, and welcome to the Fighting Game Banter Podcast. Here, we talk about what's going on in the fighting game community, the culture, and also the development of fighting games itself. This is a special video version, however, it has been edited compared to the audio version, which is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, and various other podcast services. Once again, thank you for watching and enjoy the show. Super Combo GG 956 Productions Vortex Gallery and still has time to make a new local called Warring Triad. The Fighting Game Banter Podcast is proud to present its first guest, Shiburitsu. How are you doing today? And if I mispronounce it, I apologize. Um, it's all good. I, yeah, and if you don't mind, um, can I call you Ship? Yeah, I prefer Ship. Ship's easy. Uh, hi, guys. Uh, yeah, I am one of the directors of 956 Productions. It's uh, been a leading role for me for a while, uh, but it's something that I share with my many <laughs> friends in the company who, who help us produce events like Vortex Gallery, uh, among other things that I spend my time with. So, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. No, thank you for being my first guest. It's definitely an honor. I so wish I could go to more of your events, but it's not ju just that. Um, you know, you update the Mizumi Wiki as long as as well as Super Combo CC, and of course the newest local, which is on Sunday. So I can't actually get to Warring Triad, right. but I I no, nah, it's not it's not your guys' fault. Like like he's um like we talked about beforehand, it was just difficult trying to get a time and you know saturdays are very very popular um sure. especially with especially with locals like last level and here here we have a tournament of thrones yeah so they so i mean sure, i completely I yeah i completely understand but what do you get to do what do you get to play with with staying so busy um so personally like i'm i'm a fan of just like every kind of fighting game so it can be like um you know anything modern anything retro uh but like my habits are like usually i'm at home uh you know working and and planning and stuff so i, I don't really have like a ton of time to to do anything specific so I, I love to just try whatever's popular whatever's new at the moment so like street fighter 6 came out obviously i've been playing tons of street fighter 6 ever since it came out i think it's a brilliant game uh, recently, I've been playing a lot of Granville Fantasy versus Rising. Um, that game also very easy to just jump in and out of. Uh, so those two games have been kind of holding my attention when I'm at home and I'm just, oh, I want to try this game. I want to grind it online. It has great online. People are playing online all the time. Crossplay now. Like, it's just so easy, right? And I really like going out to locals and you know monthlies and majors and getting that more specialized like niche experience so like sometimes i'll hop on fightcade um and play a couple of games but i really like meeting up in person and playing retro games i really like uh, super nintendo fighters gundam wing endless, endless duel i like uh, neo geo games like fighters history dynamite carnival's revenge um kazuna encounter which is my background here one of my favorite games on the neo geo uh just you know Retro games, I love to play in person. Vampire Savior is a game I got into big time in the past, like, two years. Uh, big fan of VSAV. I still need to participate in a bracket one of these days at a major for VSAV. I think that's going to be something I'm going to try to do this year. And, um, yeah, I guess that's the spread of it. Um, like, you, you mentioned Melty Blood. Melty Blood is uh, one of my favorite anime fighting games, or really one of my favorite fighting games, period. Uh, Actors in Current Code, specifically. And um, I try to support it offline as much as possible uh, because I think it's a, a game that has a very strong net play community, but is also really fantastic to play offline. It's a game that I find very special to enjoy in person. Um, and there's a lot of us in the area who are passionate about it, uh, but it is a game that is a little more difficult than just any other game, like uh, games that you can just boot up on a PlayStation or an Xbox or whatever to, to play. So it, you do kind of have to be willing to go out there and do the work and set up the PCs and, you know, deal with the controller issues and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, usually when you see uh, actors again, current code being played, like you mentioned, it's usually just like people bringing their laptops and that's what we're playing. Um, but I do pride myself on bringing that space to wherever I'm at. Like I want people to be able to play that game offline. 
um, I think it's a really enjoyable experience. And I play it online, you know, from time to time, but it does require you to kind of set up matchmaking and set up and hang out with people. And I don't usually have a ton of time for that. I, I really, when I'm at home, uh, you know, I want to take a quick break. I usually just hop on something with matchmaking. I uh, can't understate the importance of that enough. Um, so yeah, something like that. Like in person, I really prefer to just play niche games. Uh, you know, my favorites, my anime, retro, you know, obscure games. I really enjoy that in-person experience where you're just playing like a weird and crazy game. And then uh, when I'm at home, obviously, you know, I want to play the shiny new thing. I want to try it out. And, you know, the thing about all these news games is that they cater to doing that. They have really great matchmaking, really great netcode, really active communities. So, yeah, I guess that's, you know, what I'm up to these days in terms of playing games. No, not a problem. And from what I understand, you were a part of uh, developing the community edition of Actress Again Current Code, correct? Uh, you could say that, like I added a piece to it, right? Com community edition has been around for a while because it, I want to say like 2015 where rollback started to be a possibility for multi blood current code. Um, it was set up in a way that basically you could connect to another player directly and, um, you know, it improved controller support and it added better training mode functions and just like little things. Uh, on top of the rollback netcode, which was huge for the game, and it's kind of a big reason why it's so popular out here in the West. Um, but Community Edition is also kind of a moving target of a project. It's just people adding components. So like me, for example, like my contribution to that whole thing is Concerto, which is a client that creates lobbies for you. So before this, we couldn't get together in a single room and spectate each other and challenge each other directly and know what everyone else is up to. Because when you have the current like CC caster program that provides the rollback net code, you can only connect to somebody or you can host a session for somebody to join. And then if you want to spectate, you have to wait for the server to kind of figure out if uh, there's even a session active for, for that given host, if that makes sense. It's kind of a whole system. So it, it's a little time consuming and it's not very easy to use for group sessions. It's great for playing one person, two person sessions where it's like two people playing and then there's maybe one person spectating. It's great for that. But if you want to have like a lobby night where you and your local scene get together and we do this over here in the North Carolina FTC Discord all the time, where we'll get like 10, 15 people in a, in a single room and you can see, oh, all these two people, these two people are playing, these two people are playing these two people are playing and you can spectate any of them in the single room so that really helps um kind of get people into it because they see that it's active they see how much activity is going on they can host like a session it's easier for them to like oh let's all get together on you know friday night and let's play multi-blood on, on in the lobby right so it's really nice for that reason um that's like its main purpose right and then there's other little tools that community edition has received just from people in the community contributing over time. Uh, like I'll shout out the training script, um, which adds like, you know, you guys know Street Fighter Six has like the frame meter, right? And then there's like people modding that into Grand Blue and Guilty Gear and stuff. There's like that little frame meter mods. Well, multi but has the same thing. It's just a, an extra tool that we've added. And so that's like part of the community addition. So it's just like, it's, it's this big like group effort, you know, that people do to make the game more playable and more modern over time, uh, which is really cool. I've never seen anything like it. And I'm super happy to like contribute to it. Cause it's like, it's really unique. Nothing like this exists in any other genre, like straight up. No, I completely agree. In fact, um, I will be guilty of saying like the last actual local that I attended was a tournament of Thrones in 2022, back when it was held in Raleigh. And it literally was, um, uh, you know, community edition. I was trying, um, I was trying Half Moon, uh, Satsuki, and I swore I, you know, for a month I practiced the trying to do the Sandori, right? But even when I was, even though I did okay, it was, and I kid you not, because you are absolutely right about people bringing their PCs, but. Yeah, I got beat easily by a person using the keyboard. Like, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just, I res, I definitely respect that because I am from that time of emulation where you didn't have, um, controller or fight stick support, especially like using like Generation One main, 
And you know, right. you really were a keyboard warrior, especially trying to uh, pull off certain moves. Like I could not play um, KOF 96 to save my life because there was no way I was pulling off a raging storm on a keyboard at that time. Right. I mean, multi blood current code is like it's a PC game when you think about it. Like, yeah. sure, it it had PS2 versions and it had arcade. You know, it's on arcade, but like it is a PC game. There's a native PC version. That's the one everyone enjoys. That's the one that is the lowest input delay uh, and received the latest balance patches. And so, you know, everyone in the community just kind of wishes they would give us a PlayStation version at some point because it would make hosting it offline that much easier, even if the net code couldn't be officially ported into the game. Like having it on console would be still be a godsend, but that's not the case. So, you know, you have to get into specialized setups and you have to account for people showing up with keyboards. Um, we we did have somebody show up at, at Warring Triad last month uh, in our debut event with a keyboard to play because it's just a PC game. People are, and that's the thing, it has a weird sort of extra appeal in a way because since it's a free to play game, essentially, you can buy the Steam version to support the developers and I encourage you to, but since it's kind of like a free PC game, there's people who are playing free PC games who can get into it, you know? So people who just play games on their keyboard, you know, there's a lot of games that you play on your keyboard. You play the biggest shooters and the biggest MOBAs and the biggest, you know, PC games in the world on keyboard. And this game is like that as well, where you, you can play on keyboard, you can enjoy it. So bringing that to offline is difficult, right? It requires that little bit of extra work. But, you know, you get used to doing it. And if you really like the game and you really enjoy what it produces offline, then you'll do it. And, you know, I've been happy to I've actually got a setup sitting here off shot where I have like a mini PC that I've bought for setting up so that you can just kind of turn it on and it boots into the game. And it has controller support pretty much as good as it can get. Audio is already set up, you know, PlayStation controller plug in won't steal your audio or nothing. Just all that stuff, just so that I can make the experience that much better because it is valuable when you go to an offline and it just works on PC, it's very difficult to do and it's not perfect, but having a PC environment where things just work is, is really nice. It's really nice. People really want this, but it's very difficult and it's not always possible. Uh, I try to do it for what I can though. No, that's, that's awesome. I like, I know there are differences between the steam version versus a uh, community edition. I kind of ran it myself into that same problem around like the beginning of the pandemic. I really wanted to try different games because I was playing Sam show and that delay based net code, like pretty much killed it. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, I, yes, the fight Kate, I was doing rubble fish. I was playing fighting EX layer cause it did have rollback. Yes, it does. But at the same time, I got like a humble bundle pack and I got to experience games that I wouldn't normally play. Chaos Code, Battle Fantasia, Battle Arcus, a lot of stuff that I've noticed that is included at Vortex Gallery. I was mm -hmm. curious if any ter if you have been allowed to or do you usually have mystery games at your events? Uh, so... That's complicated. So Vortex Gallery is, uh, it's many things, right? But it's primarily a event that takes place within a major to represent the community events, right? The communities, tournaments. So it kind of depends, you know, um, in the Midwest where we're going to Frosty Faustings to host Vortex Gallery or Frosty Faustings, they already have mystery tournament, Chicago's mystery tournament, right? And so that's outside of our purview. And obviously it's awesome that we have that there. Um, and then if you go to Evo, for example, Evo doesn't have a history of running mystery. Um, and given that people see that as kind of a really big opportunity for individual games to shine because of how many people attend Evo, how many people watch it, it's usually not something people are asking for because it's, it's seen as sort of a prestige event, right. For a given game that's selected for the Evo lineup. Um, and then the online portion mystery online is possible, a little more difficult. Uh, and it's for that reason, we haven't ever received that request. And it's not something that we're personally thinking about, uh, because 
we just try to cater to individual communities that want to have their game showcase. Like mystery is cool, but I think mystery is a great format for offline and whether or not the venue or the, the culture around the venue that we're working with has mystery has kind of never really been our call. Um, so I, I really wouldn't have much to add there. However, um, I do want to shout out that we did decide to, Add something a little interesting to Vortex Gallery at Frosty's, which is the Mugen Random Select Bracket. Now, this was brought up by fellow North Carolina TO EX Falchion, uh, who ran it in a Charlotte event and then proposed to us the idea of running it at Frosty's. And we kind of like that idea because it plays into that vibe. We watched some videos of the of the tournament that they ran, and basically they have like this Mugen full game of like like hundreds of characters and they're all ridiculous and you don't know what you're going to get. And so you just have to random select and you have to play with that character. That's it. That's what you got. And so I was really interested in that idea because I think it adds to the vibe that is already kind of established, like just having this weird, crazy fun bracket where, you know, what you even get to play with is unexpected. So that kind of thing, you know, we're open to that kind of fun stuff. Uh, but it really does depend on the opportunity. We haven't had a ton of opportunities really glad that we do for the midwest event though yeah and that's that's awesome that was probably one of the big things i did early during the pandemic is like okay i can't necessarily play anything because it's all delay based so what can i do and that's when i first discovered salty bet and of course they're always running uh mugen tournaments so that was remarkable Right, One right. thing I love about Vortex Gallery is that you do not just highlight niche games, but it really it realistically seems to be like the only true venue where people can access delay based netcode games and actually play games that they wouldn't normally be able to play online because no one wants to touch delay-based netcode games like Chaos Code, like Battle Fantasia. Um, sadly, CES was very, very disappointing learning that the new Yata Kazaru was going to be delay-based, that they could yeah. not do robot. Uh, I will say, like, I think it's a nice means of exposing people to games that they've never had the opportunity to play before or maybe games that they don't play very often. And I agree with what you're saying. I will say that personally, um, you know, those communities will exist no matter what, even though people want to say, oh, it's a dead game or whatever. You know, those games have their culture around them, just people who want to enjoy them, people who like the ideas of it. I will shout out Chaos Code at Frosty Fosting's having 20 entrants right now. Um, it looks like they're going to get more. So, I mean, that game and this is still has a player base who show up to these offline events. And that's really the nice part about doing what we do is you're right. You know, a lot of people don't want to touch these games, especially as netcode is, it's always been important, but as the SGC grows larger, it grows even more important. It's nice that we have places for these communities to get together and be represented offline where none of that stuff really matters. Right. Um, so that's like a big part of the work that we do with Vortex Gallery is being able to showcase these games that for X or Y reason don't get to be at the forefront of the conversation. Um, and I mean, a lot of these communities like Chaos Code is, is a good example. They have events that they like to call their home that they will show up to year after year. Frosty Fossings is one where they're always there, right? So it's it's nice to respect that. And it's nice to, to bring that to people. I think um, like mystery as a as a means to expose people to like niche and obscure games is great especially because viewers will see it and you know they'll be like what is that i want to try that i want to know what's going on with that and maybe they'll play it and they'll lab it and they'll find their own fun with it maybe they'll get into the community so i'm always you know pro games that expose um you know viewers to just first impression you know what is going on what is this game about just no preconceptions about it they just see this game and they have to look at it and the game sells itself right uh so big fan of that um and yeah yatagarasu uh enter the eastward being a delay-based game i mean like 
this whole thing has brought up kind of a conversation about like, is a game allowed to be successful if it's not going to have good online play? And I think that like, absolutely. Right. I think there's a lot of brilliant games that just don't have strong online that people still enjoy that, you know, I'm happy to represent wherever I can. And, you know, they have passionate communities to this day, but Yata Garasi was an interesting case where they literally crowdfunded rollback netcode and, and didn't deliver. Right. It, it's still not there. And they're talking about how they've, it, it's just, it's just this thing where I really wish developers would be upfront about their online play uh, because I think it just rips the bandaid off and it, it creates more meaningful expectations about what people can do with it. And when the Yatagarasu developers go on, you know, press releases talking about how they've made their own netcode from scratch and they have these, you know, lobbies and the ability to wait and, you know, play the game while waiting in training mode. And they have this, you know, news application or something they're talking about they're talking about how you can like see the status of your matchmaking entry like on a website i don't know why you would do that but i guess you do that you can have that and the thing is they're just dodging the fundamental question of like is the thing that you guys promised actually there it's not right so um obviously there will be people who play the game and i i am curious to see people enjoy it at a high level because it's not a game the game's footage does not tell you what kind of game it is at a high level and i think that's really unfortunate when you look at the trailers they've been putting out it's just this very basic gameplay just two kind of characters just walking around the screen and, you know landing like one hit on each other and it's just very it doesn't sell me you know <laughs> so i'm sure there are people who know the game who are interested in seeing the changes and will probably showcase them um, and I look forward to seeing that stuff, but like, yeah, it, it's a, it's a weird case of like, they are literally setting themselves up to have a kind of unfortunate, you know, reception from the players. Yes. And that's, was the thing with the, the Rumblefish too, that really, really got me because it was a game that I really, really love. And then Suncrest games and three goo re released it with no, no play testing, no beta, no demo whatsoever. And it was pretty much dead on arrival, especially when, and even now, they released the game in a 16.9 with no consideration for the 4.3 uh, 4 format and the importance of it. Yeah, yeah. I think the importance of it is is the the key point because like you're right um the rumblefish was i can i guess the idea was you know this game has a very limited kind of shelf life outside of japan we can bring the game to the west and we can i guess in their idea have a better experience by making it a widescreen game but the thing is that the most vocal people about you know the rumblefish or any game retro niche obscure are people who've already played it who, who've gone the length the distance to enjoy it with other people already and so they're going to go in with those preconceptions and i don't think the studio who made this necessarily anticipated that they they clearly they shipped something that worked right but they didn't take into consideration that people were expecting the original experience right um maybe they didn't think the original experience was worth keeping and that's a mistake right because you want to appeal to people who are passionate about the game even if there's not that many of them let's be honest right even though if there's not that many of it the thing is that those people if you praise if you give them something they can praise they will do so they will give you positive steam reviews they will give you good you know good word of mouth at events at, at locals at you know online they'll post clips they'll stream the game they'll you know whenever these retro ports come out i find it very strange when they just clearly oversight you know they clearly just don't see the the competitive community they don't cater to them because like those are the people who are going to play the game when the game comes out people are going to go on like twitch for example and they're going to be like is this good and they're going to want to see somebody play it and if the people who enjoy it already who have been like emulating it or using a mod or they have you know, original hardware and, you know, they want to play it and then they go and it's like, this sucks. They've changed a bunch of stuff. It's just not good. And they, the thing is that because those people have a, a bias towards the original version, they're very convinced 
that what they're saying is right. And so they sound very persuasive. People who would not have even looked at this game otherwise are going to be like, oh, why do I care? If the people who care about this stuff don't like it, why would I like it necessarily? You know, it doesn't sound like anyone's having a good time playing this game. So I really hope, you know, that these developers, I, I mean, Suncrest, as you mentioned, I believe is their name, whatever it is, they they clearly had, a, you know, they've clearly had updates working. They're trying to make it a better product. Clearly they're listening. There's, there's funding somewhere for that. And I'm glad, I'm glad that that's the case. I hope that, you know, the community can eventually have a good version of the game to play on out of this. I think everyone prefers to have an official version because it makes it an easier sell. Uh, but, you know, um, I hope it's an example uh, that other developers follow of like, oh, we should have these things you know, there from the start, we should make sure that the game preserves the original vision. We shouldn't assume that because the original version was like four by three, you know, retro style, that that's somehow antiquated. People still like that stuff. That It doesn't really change the, the reception, I think. So, yeah, I mean, you know, I hope uh, retro ports can get better. They usually aren't. There's not a lot of good retro ports. Thank you, Code Mystics. Please, please do another one. You know, I know you guys just got off Sam's show. Maybe do another one sometime. That'd be fun. Yeah. And once again, thank you, because I know that I could, I easily could keep going. And I'm like, one question, one question. And it's like, I literally just have one last question. I promise I'll leave it like this. Has there ever been a game, a fighting game, like you've wanted to, you wanted to put it at Vortex Gallery? But there isn't a player base that you know of that. You oh yeah, could... like I could just say yeah, absolutely. There's a ton of games like that. Um, and I, you know, when I if I name any of these games, there's going to be somebody who will say like, oh yeah, I play that. But like, you have the thing is, you have to justify it to people. Like, oh yeah, this game is going to do numbers if we put it there. And there were some games here on this list for Frosty Faustings where you know people were not sure that it was going to be big. And then it was big. So like Akatsuki BlitzConf has 34 entrants right now. As far as I know, that's the biggest this game has ever gotten uh, in North America. Um, and people were not sure that that was going to be a popular game going in. And it's one of the most popular right now. And Sailor Moon is a popular game. But is it like so big that we have to increase the cap registration? Apparently, yeah, it is. So, you know, there's surprises like that. That being said, um, Kizuna Encounter is a game I would love to see offline. I've only ever hosted like tournaments on Fightcade for it because I really like that game. But uh, offline, I've never seen it played. And I'm not sure that enough people know how to play the game that I would ever even try. Uh, but yeah, that's one. Um, that's that's like top of my head type thing. Um, I think else? it's also weird because I, from what I understand, I think that's like the first real tag based fight it is one of the first tag based fighting games and it's it's not clear which one came first between like x-men versus street fighter and this one but it is one of the first um that um i would love to see maiden and spell played offline um oh. it has a great net code but i would love to see that played offline i think it'd be pretty hype um yeah i'd have to go through my retro stuff to see like what's there but like yeah those two are probably off the top of my head some games that i would love to see played offline um usually you know there's a game out there offline there's a community that shows up offline somewhere so vortex gallery has had a vortex gallery's lineup uh even before i started working on it you know when it was an amiibo always really appealed to me so a lot of the stuff that's on it is stuff that i would personally want to see run already you know so that kind of i'm 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 in my element already thankfully no, and no, and again, I really do appreciate it because clearly there are games that I wish would have, or I don't know if there's an online scene. Like I know you can't say them, but I can go ahead and say the ones I would like to see personally. But again, this is why I mentioned that 30 frame FPS comment. I would personally like to see um either psychic force or psychic force. Uh, 2012. Yeah. Um, so I I know the guy who like I know a guy who like really represents that game and um it's pretty cool. It's it's uh on Fightcade now and it's a game that I guess like for various reasons 
it it still has to grow the community now that it has rollback, you know, that you can play it on Fight Cave with Flycast and stuff. Um, the community, I guess, needs to grow around that opportunity. And then I'm sure it will show up at an offline event. I feel like there's definitely been Psychic Force 2012 tournament. I don't know where. There was one in Evo Japan, apparently. Evo Japan 2019 is apparently a, just quick Google search. I don't know where else they've had this, but yeah, in North America, it would be cool. Uh, but it is it is kind of down to the community to decide to represent that. And that's literally, I remember um, going to Lost Ark and actually like going in and seeing like, there's a psychic force cabinet. There yeah. is, um, and of course, sadly, it's never gotten a console release. And this is the other one that frustrates me is Fighting Lair. Yeah, Fighting Lair is, uh, I really want to play that game. I hope that there is some way that Fighting Lair will ever release off, you know, in a in a different way, but exactly. probably not. Arika is a very, I don't know, not a very they they're a very weird company. Um, they don't really care to keep their games on all platforms. They they put out like weird Nintendo Switch versions of their games and they make games that literally have a shelf life. Because uh, a lot of people don't know that Arika is the co-developer of uh it was like 90, it's like Tetris 99 and F099. That's all them. Like a lot of people don't know that. And um, like those games literally get discontinued because they're like live servers, online games, and Nintendo shuts down the servers and you can't play them. So um, I would, I would really like to see Fighting Lair um, on like a modern release or some way or right. somehow or on like Fight Kate or something. But like that specific board is it's not that popular. And that's one of the reasons I want you as my first guest is that I feel that a lot of people do focus on the bigger games, especially if they're looking to be not necessarily competitive, but even be in like a commentator role. I mean, that's what pays the bills. I, I can't really disagree with that assessment, to be honest. Yeah, You know, like if you want gigs, you have to be available for what people are asking for yes and so with these with these kinds of uh game you know commentators in in the business who want to commentate like a guilty gear or a street fighter or a tekken like yeah you need to if you want to live the dream of traveling to various events and and get paid to to talk to people and you know sp spread a game then you have to have some talent games that are popular it's just the fact of the matter I think it makes you, I think it's a valuable asset to be able to commentate niche games because as games become more popular, you become in demand because there's not a lot of people in that space who can talk the way you do, right? Like if you know how to commentate like an anime game that is getting very popular, then it, you know, it, it pays to be one of those people already there because people will come to you and they'll be like, I don't have anyone else. Can you do this? And you, you know, you can take it. Uh, but I mean, being a commentator for niche games, usually you're not just the commentator you're also like the tournament organizer you're usually like one of the top players you're usually one of the people who writes the wiki you know stuff like that it's a very multidisciplinary nature when when it comes to obscure games right um so yeah i mean being able to commentate niche games i wish i was able to do it as well uh but i recognize that like doing that is difficult and the opportunities to do so are very rare yes so, and by the way, I want to thank you because you actually do have the one niche game that I that I literally could commentate, which is uh, Advanced VG2. That is oh, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. such a fun game. Yeah. I mean, that's legitimately like the only game I felt like if someone asked me to commentate that and the one other game that I really wish would have um, a competitive scene. Um, luckily, you know, we now have PlayStation rollback, and that, of course, is um, Slap Happy Rhythm Busters. Yeah, people should totally get into playing that. It's like, yeah, it's, it's just cool. a fun game. I, I got roped into playing that um, at Climax of Night in 2022. Yeah, yes, I, I saw that you mentioned that that was like legit, like your favorite Vortex so far. Um, was, I mean, not was climax like my favorite. 
Oh yeah, it's like favorite FGC event. Yeah, probably. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I really liked it. It was really, really. It's a, it's a, a really great event and a really great venue and a very nice town and a, you know, with really nice people. So what can I say? Yeah, and once again, I thank you for doing this. Is there anything that you want to share with people, socials, and or obviously come to Vort? I mean, yes, definitely come to Vortex Gallery rare and valuable in this space. You know, Frosty Fossings is running their main stage tournaments on Friday and Saturday, uh, but we are going to be running community tournaments from Thursday evening all the way up until Sunday night. So feel free to, you know, join us if you have the ability to. I hear flights are still cheap. There's still ability to register. There's like three days left to register at the time of recording for competitors, but uh, registration for community tournaments will be open until the 20th for the most part. So absolutely, you know, if this podcast is out by them, take, check it out. Um, or just, you know, buy a spectator pass, come on down, hang out with us. Uh, you can check us out at 956 Productions on Twitter, uh, also on YouTube, or you can go to vortexgallery.moe.moe for uh, information about the events. We just published our rule sets. We published the Macharino pages for all of the participating events to crowdfund, so feel free to interact with those. And um, frostyfossings.com for, uh, you know, event schedule and event policies and things like that. Okay, uh, I, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was going to ask, um, are you... Are you still looking for volunteers and TOs? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we're, we're uh, open. If you just want to come in to help out, you know, feel free to fill out the volunteer form over on vortexgallery.moe. For bracket runners, if you want to help us out, if you're trying to commentate a game, feel free to let us know. We'll see if we have some space for you. We we definitely have been looking. Um, and, um, you know, most, more than anything, you know, if you are coming, then please, you know, feel free to register for a community event. There's not a lot of time left. And uh, I would really... I would really, and I know a lot of the TOs would really appreciate you guys uh, participating with us because having four days of dedicated ballroom space for community tournaments is unheard of and valuable, and I want to make it as big as a success we can. Yeah, I do find it amazing that you literally will have four days of tournaments. And speaking of where you're talking about hotel rooms and hotel space, were you able to get one for Combo Breaker? I'm not going to combo breaker. Um, I am okay, okay. planning on visiting Slashback uh, because that is run by my friend Brett, and it, I really want to visit the West Coast and I really want to support that event. Uh, so, with my you know availability, I would like to go in April to visit Slashback, and I encourage anyone in who's interested in going to a West Coast anime event to check it out um, as well. Um, so that is my plans, and then from there I will be taking a break. Uh, you know, I got to work on Evo. Right. Um, assuming i will i don't really have anything to announce right uh but uh i would probably be going to evo so i should put my time aside for that and then i will be making it to climax of night six when it returns later this year i assume that will be after evo um and i will absolutely be there and that's kind of what my plan is right now combo breaker i really want to go to 2025 maybe um you know i i just have so much going on this year and you know i'm grateful for that but Got to make my decisions. No, I, I hear you. And where's Slashback located? That's going to be at the Guild House in San Jose, California. Ooh. If you guys want to know more about it, it's a Slashback event on Twitter. Slashback.info is their website. I know that it's not up to date at the time of recording this, uh, but it will be update or uh, updated. And uh, you can go to start.gg slash Slashback for uh, the actual event page, which is like up to date and all that stuff. And um uh, it's going to be, it's a really cool show. I know a lot of people are really interested. I know that hotels have been selling out for that. Uh, I know that people are like grand blue for that event is like already near cap and they had to like expand it or something. And there's like a ton of people really hyped for this event. And I'm really, I heard the first one was really good and I really want to go out and support the, the people working this one for this. So I will be there. Absolutely. All right. Thank you very much. Shib for joining us. This is Jonas Brasco. This is the Fighting Game Banter Podcast. And also, as the first guest, you will receive a thank you card and a Fighting Game Banter Podcast sticker. Oh, I'm going to have to find a place to throw that one. Thank you. Yeah. It had stick, leverless. What you working with? Uh, So I have offset. You can't see it here because I removed my background, but I have a KIT2 up in the top of my closet here. I have a drone that I use with Sonro Parts. I have a snack box micro sitting around here somewhere that I use. Um, my arcade sticks are mostly for playing arcade games that are not fighting games. Mm -hmm. uh, so Gundam Maximus is one of my favorite games. And I use arcade stick for that for on PlayStation. And um, 
I use Leverless for a lot of retro fighting games. So like Vampire Savior, I prefer my snack box. Um, and then a lot of the new stuff coming out, Street Fighter, Mortal Kombat, uh, Grand Blue, I just stick to my pad. I'm very partial to the DualShock 4. I hate the DualSense. I have one from my PS5. It's horrible for fighting games. I don't know why they did this. Uh, but I have, you know, a book converter for that. So I I use a little bit of everything depending on my 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 use case. Okay. I'm just I'm just serious. I'm just curious if you like for Warring Triad, even though I won't be there, if you're if you're gonna be going in there rocking the keyboard. Uh, so I have a keyboard adapter, a keyboard to gamepad adapter that I bought specifically to test because um, I never use any of those and I wanted to debug like issues with them. I wanted to test them to make sure that my computers that I use for the setups would actually accept them. So I do have a keyboard adapter. I personally do not play on keyboard. I probably haven't done that since like way back in the day when I played like Third Strike on Fight Cave 1. That was like when I did that, and that was it. <laughs> okay. I'm going to end it now. Thank you Absolutely. for joining. This is Jonas Braska with the Fighting Game Banter Podcast. Thank you for listening to this special edition video version of the Fighting Game Banter Podcast. As always, the video version has been edited, and the audio version is a lot longer than what we put on social media. So if you want to hear the full interview, please check out your various podcast subscription services like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, and etc. where you'll get to hear a longer version of what you heard here. Thank you again for watching, and hopefully you'll be listening on whatever services you choose. Have a good one.